Hey everyone, I'm Rather Incoherent, and today I wanted to talk about all the decks I've been playing recently off of the channel with my tabletop group. A lot of my content tends to be analysis and, in particular, of my process of learning the game and what I found out that I think might be insightful to other people. So a part of that learning process that doesn't make it into the videos is any games I play with my tabletop group, because that isn't YouTube content, that's just us sitting down, relaxing, and having a good time. But all the same, we're still playing the game, I'm still learning, and I want to talk about the decks that I've played in particular. I've got all the decks my teammates played as well, but I'm going to be covering them in less detail because just fundamentally, since they are to my decks, while they influence my opinions, I haven't been the player behind them. I don't know how well piloted they were. I don't know how optimized the decks were. I care about that way more than the other people at my team. So while I do learn from watching them play their characters, I don't place it under the same critical lens that I put my own decks under. While I've been doing this introduction, you may have noticed this Preston deck has an ungodly amount of experience. And flipping through the other characters, my Skids deck has an ungodly amount of experience. And let's not even get started on this Rex Murphy deck. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by talking about how each of my decks ended, then show you how they started, and find a midpoint somewhere that much more accurately represents how the deck was played over the course of a campaign. I talked about this Preston deck a while back in a video about investigators that underestimated. The interaction between Old Key Ring and Look What I Found is devious. It allows you to use Look What I Found on three and four trial locations, the upgraded one on even five trial locations. The point of this deck is that it uses Black Market to essentially put all of its events on the board every turn. You get all your assets in play while you're setting up, and then you hold about eight cards in your hand and put the rest into play every single turn with Double Double onto the Black Market, and that's going to give you the ability to spend your actions playing and investigate, which you fail, look what I found, look what I found. Then you're able to play your Intel reports as well, and your call for backups, and if you want it, you can use your Ace in the hole, you can give it to somebody else. The idea of this deck isn't that it's an infinite deck, but that you lock yourself into a repeated turn, and the turn's absolutely insane. You get like 10 Tesla's clues when your teammates takes Ace in the Hall to your Black Market, and you do the exact same thing next turn. I never lived that dream. And while it was very, very close frequently, I never really got there. It didn't matter. I was still doing really, really strong things. But to say that I was locked into this effect really isn't true. And the biggest thing I learned is that this deck already has it, but I believe the previous deck, the second to last scenario, yeah, that's when I finally got Drawing Thin. So Drawing Thin in this deck is insanely important. There's also a lot of other cards in the deck that are insanely important. This deck is just legitimately very expensive on experience. And when we go to the level zero deck, you're going to see that I'm playing a different Preston entirely. I'm a Dark Horse Preston and I double adaptable out of it. Oh, apparently I found a way to single adaptable out of it. Well, go past me. I thought I had used to adaptables, but apparently I found a way. But the point that I want to make here is that Drawing Thin costing 6 experience is actually just a massive nerf to this deck. Drawing Thin is so incredibly helpful for getting you to set up faster, and not being able to run it really hurts the consistency with which you get online. That said, coming over, you see that I actually cut Faustian Bargains for Drawing Thin. Pretty much the entire game, I was able to just give Faustian Bargains to my teammate, except for obviously once I cut it during the second to last scenario. And Falsy and Bargain is being given to your teammates as a Preston is actually a really good use of an action. I actually felt like I was trolling my team when I cut Falsy and Bargain so I could set up faster, because I felt like they might actually need the money, but I certainly didn't need to set up faster because I was already setting up reasonably quickly. However, before I had Drawing Thin and after I had Drawing Thin was night and day. Drawing Thin is really important, and not being able to get it because of experience constraints really sucks. And coming over to the starter deck for the Preston, you can see... I'm really just a different deck. I'm a Dark Horse press, and I've got Fire Axe and Mariner's Compass and Dark Horse. And I'm mostly just using the standard stuff you would expect to see in this sort of Preston deck. Look what I found. You handle this one a one-up cunning distraction because despite being sort of a meme, it is actually very, very good and came in clutch several times in our campaign. My entire team was tremendously disappointed when I finally got this card. Like, they all understood why, but no one was happy to see it go. It's just like a solid deck. This opening Preston Dark Horse build is good. It's not insane, but it's very good. And you can see that in my next upgrade, I think I just go straight for Double Double, I do. And in the next one, I don't actually get to transition out. In fact, I believe it might take me even a one more upgrade past this point. Yeah, I'm still putting things into my Dark Horse deck. I'm currently at a 24 experience deck and I haven't transitioned to the thing that I wanted to do. And I think here is finally the point where I'm going to get the transition, yeah, it's one hell of an upgrade phase. A lot of things change in this upgrade phase. You can see I adapt to the old key ring and the rabbit's foot to help me draw. I start using well-connected counter-espionage and cheat the system to generate money, as well as getting a second antiquary. 
This is the first point where I'm finally doing what the deck wanted to do, and I'm at 35 experience. It's outrageous how long it took me to transition to this, to the point that it's tremendously relevant as a downside to the deck that for most of the campaign, I was just playing Dark Horse Preston, which to be fair, was much better than I gave it credit for before I played it. But even though this deck is busted, even the simple 35 virgins really, really strong, I immediately felt like it was correct to transition into this. But especially with the taboo list where this deck doesn't have draw length then. It takes so long to get to this point, and there's still so much left that you want. I thought he was a lot better than I gave him credit for. I don't think he's the monster some people make him out to be. I think the amount of experience it takes to get to the big money deck is too much. I think Dark Horse Preston is not insane, he's just quite good. And even though I never truly locked into that insane turn with the endgame deck, I was still doing really strong things after I set up all the time. Not quite hitting that repeatable turn isn't a meaningful death and I was still completely broken. But getting to that point, the setup turns, the campaign before it, like 35 experience is for a lot of people a whole campaign. Most people aren't getting all VP, and a lot of campaigns don't give out as much experience as campaigns like Edge of the Earth, Forgotten Age, and Circle and Time do, which coincidentally are the three campaigns that we played most recently. Alongside this Preston deck, one of my teammates, our main Kluber, was Ursula Downs. And this Ursula deck really showcased how abusable her ability is. I'm going to refer to these people by name when I talk about their decks. This is Madison's deck. And apparently he was playing without Taboo List for the last time in this campaign, thus untabooed Milan and one experienced Pathfinder. And the big thing that I learned from this isn't just that like Ursula's good. I know Ursula's good. She has good defensive stats, four in bulk. She's a seeker. She's going to be good. The big thing that I learned is how reliably a late game Ursula using Ariana's Twine, Eon Chart, and Pathfinder, which are like very normal cards for an Ursula to have, can just force her ability to trigger. She can start at the only location with clues, Pathfinder out, Eon Chart back in, and then investigate twice, and she hasn't spent an action yet. And that's absolutely sick. Also, because of, in large part, me being Preston and funneling him money all campaign with Faustian Bargain, but also, just as much, because of Untabooed Milan, he never cut Connect the Dots. He's very happy about this because it was a pet card for him, and all of his likes seeing Connect the Dots get any play because it's absolutely sick when it goes off. But that requires you to have four resources and set it up, and that's just a whole hassle. This campaign did not sell us on Connect the Dots. It was fun, but it doesn't seem good. Going into Edge of the Earth, we had this whole big debate about whether or not which of us would be playing a Sled Dog deck. Madison wanted to play Sled Dog Leo. I wanted to play Sled Dog Yorick, and Andrew, our third player who ended up playing Sled Dog Yorick, was really confused when both of us didn't pick Sled Dog decks, and he was like, alright, Nick, just give me your Sled Dog deck, I'll play that. This is pretty similar to how I would build my own Sled Dog Yorick, and sadly, it's not quite the juggernaut that I thought it was. It is gross. There were multiple scenarios where Ursula just got destroyed by unlucky Mythos cards, but didn't die because Solemn Bow on Yorick was just absorbing all the damage. There were at least the last three scenarios, I think more than that, Andrew repeatedly complained because he was like, guys, I, I'm either doing nothing or I just killed them. I just sled dog them for three damage and they're dead. If they're not, I meet Cleaver them. And if for some godforsaken reason they have more than seven health, I survival knife them. Nobody hits me. And if they did, the beat cops or the guard dogs would kill them. Why am I even here? Because he just legitimately felt like if he was fighting, he was going to kill people. He had no chance of failing. And that is basically true. The fully set up Yorick deck is real, real strong. However, 23 assets. This is basically a deck that is assets and economy. My version of the deck actually had even more economy than this. I was running stand together, so I might have even been running leadership twos. But again, I was there with Falsy and Bargain and Ursa was there to crack the case, so he didn't need to run it himself, he could funnel the money into him. The Yorick deck is something I still really, really enjoy. I think Yorick is incredibly powerful, but the setup time they can have is a little bit rough. He's still very, very strong, but he's not quite as good as I imagined him to be. The next campaign we played was the Circle Undone, the Return to Circle Undone. It was our first time to the Return to setup. And I played a main fighter as Skids. In the previous campaign, we had talked a lot about feeling like we should either up the difficulty or play jankier characters, because by the end of Edge of the Earth, it was an unmitigated steamroll. It was the hardest we beat in scenarios up to that point. It's going to get worse in a little bit. You saw the Rex deck. But as a consequence of how well we did in Edge of the Earth, we were going to pick worse characters in Circle Undone, 
because we would enjoy playing jankier characters more than we would enjoy turning up the difficulty is how we all felt. I picked main fighter skids. My beginnings in Arkham Horror were Skids O'Toole, followed by like three other rogues as I desperately tried to make the class work. And now with a full card pool, I came back and I gave Skids my best shot, and this is what I came up with. I adamantly believe that the best way to build Skids is just with all of the passive fist bumps and melee weapons. Survival knives, switchblades, bandoliers, beat cops, ace of swords, gias. You can use a big gun. You can use two actions on a Chicago typewriter, or you can use a uh, Beretta and get plus four on your swing and already be at seven. Or you can get plus two default from these, more from beat cops, more from ace of swords, more from gias, and be swinging at nine by like turn four or five. I personally think that this is a better setup than using things like swift reload with big guns. It's debatable though. The main reason I like this more is that you're able to upgrade into it in chunks and just linearly get as much power as you can as fast as you can. You don't ever need to save for something. This double double was like second or third to the last scenario. It took me forever to feel like I had the freedom to upgrade a non-core but powerful card. Because double double actually does make your deck worse until you get to benefit from the double double. You spend eight experience on this, four resources to put it in play, and then until you've used it like three times, it hasn't even made your deck better. Double Double is really hard to use in someone who's already as weak as Skids, but as you can see, I've got some really good targets for it. Black Market for Team Utility, Economy for me, which makes me safe because of Well Connected, or just Sweeping Kick to deal more damage. And Small Favor would not normally be in the deck, but this is Circle Undone, and I've got an entire video about why I love the finality Circle Undone and why Small Favor is specifically relevant. These upgrades to Hot Shriek and Well Connected don't really matter. Small favor is what matters in this last upgrade phase, not these bells and whistles upgrades. And I legitimately believe that this skids deck is fine. It better be, it costs 60 experience to make this, but it is fine. And it doesn't take that long to set up when you have this many hits for weapons and fist bumps and the draw from black markets and easy marks and emergency caches and just using your actions with Leo and haste to draw. Like you have ways to get set up quickly. But good god, the starter deck. Let's go look at the starter deck. The starter deck is so weak for Skids O'Toole that I took in the thick of it, not just for the Kieran's Oval to upgrade as fast as I could, but for the Ace of Swords. And I legitimately don't know that I could have been the main fighter in Scenario 1 had I not hit opening Kayan's Ace of Swords. If I were to replay this campaign, I would cut the Kieran's Oval from Scenario 1 for a second Ace of Swords and easy marks, because he is just that weak in Scenario 1. He needs all the help he can possibly get. And you can see the strategy is still largely the same. The best level zero weapons available, as many fist bumps as I could put in the deck, as many skills that could possibly help me fight as I could put in the deck, because I don't have Gias yet, and these are zero cost things that do the same job. And if at the end of the campaign I felt that Skids was a really strong character, that's not how I want to phrase that. If at the end of the campaign I felt that Skids was a strong character with some setup time, at the beginning of the campaign, I thought that Skids was a weak to mediocre character with the same amount of setup time to get to that point. And that's terrifying for a main fighter. Skids' power curve is all over the place. The final deck is actually a pretty solid deck. And on the whole, after around Scenario 3, despite never feeling good about Skids, I never really struggled to do my job. Skids is better than I thought he was. This campaign was in large part the reason I stopped believing in Deed here. But I still don't think Skids is good. He's fine. But recommending him to a new player is akin to griefing. And it's weird to say those two statements simultaneously. But when I rank characters, I rank them on the assumption that someone who knows what they're doing is trying to optimize the character and has come to at least mostly similar conclusions I have. And if that's the case, Skids isn't terrible, he's not bad. And at some points in time, he's even like uniquely good in doing things no one else can. That final deck is using Double Double with Soothing Melody. No one else can do that. That's actually a really interesting thing that only Skids gets. But he's still not good. I was playing the Skids deck along Madison's Wendy and Andrew's Joe, and this is the start of Andrew just being a Joe main. After this campaign, he's going to play Joe again. Our next campaign, we're currently about to start our second run through Edge of the Earth, he's playing Joe again. He has just abandoned his role as our resident survivor player, and he's only playing Joe, basically. Also, dear God, why do you have 70 experience? I figured it out, I grabbed his Joe deck from Forgotten Age and not his Joe deck from Circle Undone. This is the right Joe deck. This is the one that he played his first time through as Joe. I think this is sort of iconic of what I think of when I think of Joe as a mediocre character. When I think of putting Joe high in C tier, this is largely the deck I imagine. 
one with a lot of assets that cost a lot of money, where he's trying to investigate and fight using those stats normally, and it just doesn't quite line up well. That said, having watched it in action now, I think saying it's high C tier is comically wrong. It's very high in B, even boat like this. Michael Lay is just very strong. Having access to Segment of Onyx, Howard Mirror, and he isn't running it here, but Occult Lexicon is very, very strong. He has insane cards in his skill slot. Coming over to his next Joe deck, or his level zero Joe decks, rather. When he starts using practice to make perfect setups, Joe starts looking like legitimately strong as a true flex character in a way that's like much more impressive than I originally gave him credit for. That said, a hallmark of Andrew's Joe decks has been two head, two foot, and every campaign he says, man, this campaign really sucks for Joe. And then me and Madison are like, I think every campaign sucks for Joe. What campaign has Mythos decks that don't punish you for having both defensive stats be trash? And I think our next campaign is going to be the first campaign where Andrew's like actually trying to fix the defensive problems that Joe has, as opposed to just losing his entire board to Vice and Villainy more than once. That happened at least twice in Circle Undone. Madison's Wendy deck is just actually gross. Um, this deck can be accurately summarized as I play Backstab and Pilfer forever. We did eventually get to the silly, silly thing that Wendy can do where um, you can play Black Market a literally unlimited number of times because when you play it, it goes under your own deck. And then you play the second Black Market and it reveals your deck, revealing the other Black Market. So you play the other Black Market for your Black Market and four cards from other people's boards until you put every single card in every single deck in play. It's not actually that good. There's no real reason to do it, but it's very funny. The thing this deck does that's really good, though, is just having incredibly high defensive stats, then get turned into proactive stats with these events. Wendy was easily the strongest character in this campaign and basically our hard carry for almost the entire campaign. All right, let's talk about Rex. I don't know if I'm on record as saying this on my channel yet. I've definitely said it with my tabletop group. I legitimately find the game less interesting and less fun when I'm playing stronger characters. I think I've definitely alluded to this in my video about Before the Black Throne, but if a character is too strong, it makes the game less fun. Anytime someone says Rex at all in their tabletop discord, I just instantly reply fuck Rex, hit enter, and then start typing out my actual response to what they're saying. It's because of this campaign. Rex is gross. You might look at this and be like, oh, it's 65 experience. Of course it's gross. Let's go look at like the 30 experience Rex deck. Here's a 24 experience Rex deck that I was playing in scenario four. I've got both copies of Cryptic Research. I've upgraded deductions. I've got an eye of truth. I mean, is that any of that even really that much better than Lucky Cigarette Case, Leo DeLuca, and the generic broken level zero shit that Seekers have? The next like 40 experience this deck got really didn't make it that much better. My last upgrade phase actually didn't improve the deck at all. I spent 10 experience, but it didn't actually matter. I cut Hiking Boots and Pathfinder to use Eon Chart instead with Ariadna's Twine and Relic Hunter to make it last forever. And yeah, that's better, but it, it didn't meaningfully improve the deck. Rex is insane, and a huge part of why he's insane is that he has nothing that is core to him. You immediately start with your Bells and Whistles upgrade. The difference is that in Seeker, Bells and whistles are cryptic research, deduction level 2, pathfinder, eye of truth, insanely powerful cards are your bells and whistles and seeker. And let's talk about the Dunwich Splash for a second. These cards are absolutely gross. They're some of the strongest cards in the game. So five off color cards might feel limiting, but the amount of power it gives you is absolutely ridiculous. Fun fact, I did a count. 50% of Seekers, not counting Norman Withers, can run Promise of Power. Just feels weird to me that that's the case. But the important thing here is that the Dumbwitch Slash is absolutely ridiculous, and there are other really good ways you can use it than just the way I've done it. This just feels like what's strongest to me. I've got support in the name of the deck, and like, that's sort of a meme, but also Crack the Case, Cryptic Research, Deep Knowledge, and Faustian Bargain can all be used on my teammates. So can Shortcut. The Eye of Truth is for my team, and I believe my next upgrade, I upgrade Archive of Conduit's Eye of Truth? Yeah. Oh, I don't get the Eye of Truth yet, I couldn't quite afford it, unfortunately. But I built this deck, like, with the goal of supporting my teammates as much as a Rex could, because it turns out you can just incidentally do a massive amount of support. This Rex deck is just insane. Before I played this, we had constantly debated among, like, the top characters. Is it Tony? Is it Gloria? If it's one of the big four Seekers, it's probably Mandy or Rex, but which of them would it be? 
it's Rex. Rex is the strongest character in the game, and it's by a landslide. These five flex cards are a not insubstantial part of that. His ability is a huge part. And the hidden thing that's broken about him, you don't have to get Mr. Rooks to find your cards. You don't have to upgrade anything to do your job. There are no cards that you're pressured into upgrading because Rex wants them more. With Rex, you just upgrade the strongest cards immediately. That's cryptic research and deduction, by the way. But in Amandy, you've got to get your Mr. Rooks. In Harvey, you've got to get your Farsights. In Amanda, like five or six cards. It's a lot more than any of these other big four seekers. But in Rex, Rex doesn't need anything at all. And I mean that. Look at this level zero deck. It's just done. I took in the deck of it for Pathfinder because I don't need nine horror soak. Normally, I would take Charisma over the Pathfinder because I do want these allies in play quite badly. But this was specifically a campaign. I haven't gotten into this yet where I picked Rex for a very specific reason. We wanted to know if Rex really was as broken as we thought he was, because after the first time we played him in Dunwich, we just never touched him again. We were like, oh, that's so strong, it makes the game less fun. So in this game, we said, Rex is the only cleaver. We're going into Forgotten Age, no one else is even playing. Flex, Rex is the only person getting clues. We're going to see if he's really as strong as we think he is. And everyone else is going to play jank, weird fighters. And since there's two fighters... That'll still be fine, and we'll get to test our, like, pet project fighters. And everyone really liked that idea. And that's the reason that I picked Pathfinder with my In the Thick of It instead of Charisma. As the only Kluver going into Forgotten Age, I felt like I couldn't afford to spend actions on movement. Going over to my teammates, Madison was playing a Diana that's just built as Pure Fighter Diana. And Pure Fighter Diana isn't really that janky of a thing to do. However, he mostly picked Pure Fighter Diana because I've been just constantly talking about how I'm not convinced Diana's actually that good for a while now. I'll admit, I've been convinced Diana's a little bit better than I've been giving her credit for, but man, the top half of the tier list in Arkham Horror is so incredibly strong that even Diana being, like, great doesn't put her that high on the tier list. And I still think that she's largely just worse than Agnes. You're going through a lot of hoops here to duplicate some wards of protection to get six head. Agnes just does it with way less effort. But Agnes is great, so saying Diana's worse than her isn't that bad. And coming over to Andrew's second attempt at Joe Diamond, it's very different, but doing a similar thing. The big thing that's happening here is that he started relying entirely on a cult lexicon and Hallowed Mirror and using the Hallowed Mirror to heal beat cops to deal testless damage and less using the guns. To the point that by the end of this campaign, I don't think I ever saw him shoot the 45 automatic. He was really just using Survival Knife if somehow something lived long enough to touch him. And this time he had a little bit more focus on defenses, but it was still in a way that didn't quite fix the problem. His plan was to use Bandolier with Tooth of ST Link, and then Inquiring Mind to get through any checks he would need to do, because hopefully that would be enough. Unfortunately, um, Inquiring Mind was literally never usable, just like his preposterous sketches, because Rex would just start his turn and get all the clues. It was a constant problem in this campaign, that as Rex, I didn't want to explore, and they would find two locations. One would have no clues, one would have like three clues. And as Rex, I'd spend one action to get all the clues they found in their turns, and then I'd be like, I guess I'll explore myself then. Because Rex is just disgusting. Even level zero Rex. He doesn't just start off stronger than the other big seekers, he stays stronger. Because they're upgrading their Mr. Rooks, they're upgrading their Farsights, whatever it is that character wants, even if it's Eon Shark. They're strong cards, don't get me wrong, and those characters are pushing them towards them and making them better. But compared to just being Rex, having the starting point that Rex is, and upgrading the best stuff that Seeker has to offer, no one competes. Rex is insanely strong. Going to our next campaign, I think next weekend we'll be starting our Edge of the Earth playthrough. And despite repeatedly agreeing that we want to play weaker characters, what keeps happening is we pick characters that are like relatively strong, but not crazy strong, and then crushing the campaign. So we're probably going to have to either play very bad characters after this, or finally switch to hard difficulty to a chorus of grins. Because even when we try to pick jankier characters, what'll happen is I'll test a character that's good, but no one's ever really tried really hard with, like Roland. Then Madison will be like, I'm going to play a weirder build of Silas this time. And like, Dark Horse Silas isn't actually weak. And Andrew's like, I'll play Joe. It's fine. And unfortunately, I don't think any of these characters are remotely bad. And I'm worried that it's going to be another steamroll. 
And it's going to be the last campaign he played before we switch up to higher difficulty. Coming over to the decks we're actually playing, though, this Joe deck is going to be our main Kluber. He's still flexing a little bit with the cult lexicons. Because of how broken what he did at the end of Forgotten Age was, he's just stopped caring about trying to do anything as a main fighter. He wants to do a cult lexicon, hallowed mirror, beat cop as his entire damage setup. And I don't really disagree with that. That's largely the conclusion I came to when I was doing the Joe Diamond healing build. And his final deck looks meaningfully different from mine. He's got like 15 cards different, which is a massive amount. But it's the same general concept of Farsight, Occult Lexicon, Hallowed Mirror, Primary Kluver, but sort of Flex Joe. And I expect this to actually be the strongest way he's built Joe yet. But I look forward to seeing my own ideas put into action and then be miserably weak compared to the other Joes. And then I'll have to eat my words. This is Dark Horse Silas. I, it looks like Dark Horse Silas to me, but Dark Horse Silas is a character I don't feel like I know how to build correctly. So we'll see if this feels right or wrong once it goes into play. What I do feel confident in is saying that Dark Horse Silas is not a weak character at all, just like I don't think Roland is weak at all. I don't think many people think of Roland as highly as I do. I've actually moved Roland up to my A plus and my tier list currently. The very bottom of it still, but regardless. I think Roland is really damn strong. I keep trying to convince myself that he isn't. I keep being like, he's only got five horror soak and a weakness that can give mental trauma, but cover up is something you can manage relatively easily. Five horror soak is not as big of a deal in blue, and blue has access to Hallowed Mirror and really good horror soak, and I just don't think it's an issue compared to how strong Seeker Splash is. Practice makes perfect. Shortcut, deep knowledge, and crack case are really good. And Astounding Revelation works in a really broken way with Stick to the Plan. And this end game deck for Roland looks legitimately gross. And I say end game, but this is edge of the earth. I'm going to get like 20 more experience than this, and the deck's going to be beyond broken at that point, just like all 60 experience decks are, I know. But still, the end game goal of this is very, very strong. I really like trying out combat training and well-prepared, because I think if combat training does have a home, it's in a well-prepared deck. And I think Roland is the best candidate for that, because he's the one that can draw towards it the fastest. And if you're playing well-prepared, you want to be drawing quickly to set up whatever well-prepared combo you're using. In this deck, I can well-prepare literally anything other than two book. I can get two fist, two foot, or two head relatively easily. Originally, I wanted to run Greta as well, so I could have four book and then six with my well-prepared and all fine clues and get more clues by killing people, but I just don't think it's worth the experience. It's the sort of thing I would do in a 55 or 60 experience deck and not the sort of thing I would actually plan for. But I just legitimately think that this Roland deck is a really, really strong deck. I don't think it has weaknesses. I think that saying that Roland is frail is built around suboptimal play or limited card pools. I don't foresee this Roland deck suffering a single mental trauma aside from mandatory mental trauma from absolute worst case scenarios with um, his weakness with cover up. But that said, that worst case scenario should never happen. I should cycle my deck every game, and if that's happening, then we should be able to get cover up dealt with because it'll show up halfway through a scenario. Oh, and of course I've taken in the thick of it, because if you're split 9-5, you just automatically take in the thick of it. That is a phrase that I hate, but it's almost universally true. There's basically no character with a 9-5 split that shouldn't take in the thick of it, because you're so safe at 9-5 that the three experience to help you deal with that 5 is more important than the safety of that 9 compared to a 7. Anyways, a brief recap. In the past three campaigns, I've played Preston Fairmont and transitioned from Dark Horse to Big Money Combo Preston. And I think Preston's really strong. I think Dark Horse is good, and I think this monster that he turns into later in a campaign is insane. But between the transition time to get here and the setup time to turn this online, I don't think he makes it anywhere near S tier. I don't even think he makes it A+. In Return to the Circle Undone, I played a Skids deck, and it convinced me that there is no D tier. It didn't convince me that Skids is good, but it convinced me that every character can be at least fine. However, that doesn't mean that I can't make a new tier list where D tier is labeled as fine. That's something I'm still allowed to do. But next time I upload a tier list, there will 100% not be a tier labeled bad or even weak. Because they aren't weak compared to the game on standard difficulty. They're weak compared to other characters. And that's not meaningful to me. Coming over to Rex, fuck Rex. I guess let's start with this. His Dumbwitch Splash is insane. Dumbwitch Splash has gotten better and better as time went on. 
The only character that's not getting massively better with their Dunwich Splash is Jenny. And that's because a lot of the really strong stuff you can take from Dunwich are going to be green cards. But even though it's gotten stronger in everyone, it's gotten to be the best in Rex. Rex can easily afford Leo DeLuca. Promise of Power with threes defensively makes you safe to the Mythos deck. It works with practice, makes perfect. Falsity and Bargain lets you cover the increased cost that Leo has or give money to your teammates. It's up to you. And you're going to trigger a cigarette case every time you trigger your ability, which is usually every turn. Next up in the list of things that make Rex broken, he's just got an incredibly good stat line and soak spread. The fact that Mandy's stat line is actually better than this by moving a fist to book is upsetting. Mandy's stat line should never have happened. His ability is insane. The fact that he has nothing he's pressured towards because he's just generally very, very good lets him immediately upgrade into powerful bells and whistles type of cards. The level zero Rex deck also just like does everything it needs to do. You really don't need anything else, and that lets you get these incredibly powerful Seacore cards that are just generically strong immediately, instead of feeling pressured to get something powerful that synergizes with you. Which is still good, obviously. Farsight's great in a Harvey, Rook is great in Mandy. But until I played Rex, I didn't really appreciate how much it slows them down. You have to get those things. And I think a big part of why I appreciate it is that I played Rex side by side with Seekers only. So I got to see Mandy slowed down by combat cards versus a Rex deck that didn't even need to get a cult lexicon because I had two fighters with me. And the difference in how focused Rex's upgrades are and how quickly he gets better compared to a Mandy where you have to sink 11 experience into Mr. Rook, Mr. Rook Charisma and then you can start upgrading your deck is massive. Mandy's first 12 experience are Mr. Rook, Mr. Rook, Charisma, Pendant of the Queen. And you, you can debate that. That's not an absolute fact. But the point is that she has some very good 12 experience there. And for Rex, that's two cryptic researches and upgraded deductions. Rex just gets to come online so much faster than Mandy. And it shows in how quickly they power spike. This 24 experience deck I was talking about, either I went into or came out of Threads of Fate with this deck, I don't quite remember. Probably came out of. I joked with my table and said, I'm going to load up my 24 experience Rex deck for the finale. And the only reason I didn't is because our Diana player said, could you keep no stolen five so that you can find my ritual dagger? Because it turned out I was unironically support Rex and was meaningfully helping my team quite a lot. There was a turn where Joe Diamond asked for a card and I said, you know what? Fine. Here's a card. Here's three from Cryptic Research. Why don't you take five resources too while you're at it? And they were just baffled because they went from like kind of going online to holy shit, I don't even know what to do with all of these resources. Since Joe was fighting primarily through a cult lexicon towards the end, I cracked the case like eight resources onto him. And I just had no reason not to. I was about to cycle my deck for like the second time on turn seven or something. May as well give someone eight resources before I do. I've been rambling for a little while, so I'm going to cut my comments on Rex now, but I do want to mention one more thing. Janae is absolutely nuts. She's an incredibly powerful card, and when you combine her with something like Hiking Boots or Pathfinder so that she can just consistently go off and then in turn consistently trigger your Hiking Boots, it's absolutely insane. Most Seekers have three or more foot, and the combo of Janae Hiking Boots gets you to five. You can evade things at that point for your team. You can pass foot checks defensively. It doesn't cost that much experience realistically. It's just really, really strong. I did not realize how powerful Janae would be. And Rex needs her even less than most people because Rex can just get all the clues himself. But there were several times where instead of clearing out victory locations, I just walked past them a couple of times using Pathfinder and Janae to move those clues out while I got other locations. The only time this really got to shine was during City of Archives because I wasn't able to use Rex's ability during that scenario but it's just an incredibly strong combo of cards. I honestly have a hard time imagining a deck where Janae isn't good, and this point in the deck is actually a really good showcase of what I say when there is an opportunity cost for other Seekers upgrading those cards that make them specifically better. There is no card in this deck that is a core card. I spent 42 experience on incredibly powerful cards. My weakest upgrades are Magnifying Glass level 0, which just give me two resources for free after my first deck cycle. That's not nothing. This entire deck is made of incredibly strong cards that you could argue are all bells and whistles to any Seeker. And that's 42 experience. Every single thing that you're making yourself get before this is making you worse than Rex. 
that opportunity cost feels invisible when you're optimizing that character, but when you compare them to someone else who doesn't give a shit about any specific card, it's really apparent just how strong the secret card pool is and how much you weaken yourself by delaying getting to this point. I'm not going to talk too much about our plans for Edge of the Earth. Next time I make a recap video, I'll tell you how it went. These two Joe Diamond decks have taught me that there's a lot of different ways to build Joe where he's still good. However, what they've also taught me is that there's probably a way to build Joe that's actually incredible. The question is primarily how long does it take Joe to become incredible and will he be safe to the Mythos deck? Because if the answer is it doesn't take long and he's safe, because like maybe he only needs like 15 experience of cards to really get going, and some of that's a dream diary, which is making him safe to the Mythos deck. If that's the case, Joe might actually just be a really damn good character. And I'm actually really surprised at how good I think Joe is. I've largely said what I had to say about Diana. I think she's good. Great even. But I still think she's just a worse Agnes that goes through so many hoops to get to the point of being worse Agnes. Wendy's insane. Um... It makes me kind of upset that the best Foot Matters deck in the game is a red character. But I mean, hey, when I did the stat line analysis video, I found out that red characters have a slightly higher average foot than green characters anyway, so I guess that checks out. Sled Dog Yorick is one of my pet decks. I really like Sled Dog Yorick. And even though I don't think it's an S-tier broken deck, I do legitimately think that it's overpowered and incredibly strong, and I was really happy to see how it performed. The one thing I dislike about Sled Dog Yorick is just how economy taxing he is. Like, of course, of course he is, he does have 23 assets, but even though that is the case, it doesn't feel weak or slow. It actually just feels like it's doing its job very cleanly. I'm surprised at how good sled dogs actually are. And I will be playing almost this exact deck on the channel in the future, because I haven't personally played Yorick, and anytime it comes to a character where I feel like I have a hot take on them, I will definitely be playing them on the channel at some point. Lastly, we've got Ursula. And while I don't think she's one of the strongest characters, I think she's very, very strong. Just not compared to what you expect out of the most broken Seekers. I feel like a lot of people are really down on Ursula, and I honestly don't see the argument. Her book is the same as Rex. Her stat line is actually just objectively better than Rex's. Missing out on the 5 slash that Rex gets compared to what she's getting does not feel good. Because basically what she's getting is Kieran's Oval and nothing else. Now don't get me wrong, 14 free experience over the course of a campaign is really good, especially in Seeker, but compared to Promise of Power and Leo to Luca, it's nothing. But the point is that her stat line is better than Rexus. Her card pool isn't that different than Rexus. Her ability isn't that different than Rexus. I've heard people say that her ability is hard to trigger because she only has four book. That's nonsense. She's a Seeker. She has all the book bumps in the world. If you think her ability is hard to trigger, then by consequence, you must also think Rexus is hard to trigger. And her ability is admittedly harder to trigger than Rexus because you only get one attempt per turn at it. But it's still not hard to trigger at all. Ursula is just really, really good. I don't agree that she's even one of the three best Seekers, but according to my tier list, being the worst Seeker in the game is still pretty good, and she's nowhere near the worst either. Anyways, that's it for me. I just wanted to quickly talk about all the decks I've been playing off the channel. Don't know why, but I'm boring it to me at the time. I've been rather coherent. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you in the next one.